Okay. Sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of our crucified and risen Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Once again, it's congregation participation in the Sermon Sunday. So, okay. Now, all of you with two feet, stomp them. Come on, stomp them. Okay. Now, all of you with two hands, raise them in the air. Okay. Now, all of you, look at your neighbor with both eyes and say, Jesus loves you. Okay. Either we have a sanctuary full of righteous, sinless people, or we have a text that no one pays any attention to. It is indeed a pleasure to look out on all of you this morning and see hands and feet and eyes in abundance. Barbara Brown Taylor, an Episcopalian priest, tells a story of her internship as a chaplain at a Georgia hospital. During an emergency drill, she was assigned to be chaplain in the morgue. As chaplains usually do a lot of listening, she expected a pretty quiet and unexciting night until the morgue attendant came in. And he took good delight in his duties as caretaker. And he offered to give her a tour. And before she could say no thank you, he opened the freezer box and said, here's where we keep all the amputated limbs. For her, it was nightmare material. Nightmare material, just like the passage from Mark's gospel that we just heard. Nowhere in the New Testament is Jesus so graphic about the wages of sin. Sin, he says, well, that's going to cost you an arm and a leg, literally. Better you should hang a big old rock around your neck and go jump in the ocean. This text probably doesn't show up on your list of favorite Bible verses. And I doubt if you'll find it carved in many altars in churches. But it does define the limits of biblical literalism. Walk into the most fundamental Bible-thumping church you can find, one where men don't swear and women don't speak in church, and I doubt you'll find many eye patches or missing limbs from sin. This passage just goes against plain reason, not to mention a, a sense of self-preservation. This text is a continuation of Jesus' teachings that we've heard over the last couple weeks. He's telling the disciples what is good for them. It would be better for you, he says four times, as he describes several awful things that would be better than to cause a little one. And he means a person of faith or a person new to faith to stumble. Jesus is trying to impress upon the disciples and to all of us two-fisted Christians here today the importance of our actions. Following Jesus is no casual thing. For the disciples, it was an eternal life or death proposition if they failed to take Jesus seriously enough. Everything they did had consequences. And depending upon their actions, they were either good news for the kingdom or they were simply bad news for themselves and for others. Is it any different for Christians today? Is it any different for you in your faith today? What Christians do and say matters. You see, we've been given power that we maybe don't even realize we have. We've been given kingdom power. And if we use it to cause someone to stumble, to lose faith in God, to deny Christ, or if we belittle someone with our words or our actions, well, how long can you hold your breath underwater? That makes this passage a threat, but it also is a promise. The disciples were full of unused power, the power of God, and Jesus was begging them to use that power wisely. And Jesus calls on us as a church of faith and each of us as individuals of faith to use the power of God that we have been given and use it wisely. 
One of the reasons I think we recoil from this passage is that it attacks our physical reality. Cut off our precious hands, gouge out our lovely eyes. The horror of the thought speaks volumes about how we, how we value our wholeness. And I think Jesus might say, fine, don't take me literally, but please take me seriously. You have a spiritual soul that is just as lovely as your eyes, just as precious to you as your hands and feet. If your spiritual soul is sick and you're using it to make others stumble, you are as crippled as you would be without hands, feet, or eyes. If your spiritual soul is sick, just as if you have cut off your feet, you cannot go anywhere worth going in this world, any place where people in darkness are crying out for the light of Christ. Yet, that doesn't seem to make us flinch when we talk about a spiritual soul as plucking out an eye. Why do you suppose so many people aren't as careful with their spiritual souls as they are with their hands, feet, and eyes? Is it human nature, I wonder, to stumble to cause others to stumble with our words or our actions, knocking them down with words or actions that cut to the quick and belittle? We're seeing that hypocrisy play out in our lives today. We're seeing it play out in our nation today. Christians talking one way to Jesus and acting another way to their neighbor, talking about how we are all God's children, but treating the oppressed and foreigner as inferior humans, talking about God's amazing grace for our forgiveness, then hoarding that grace and not forgiving others, letting grace collect bitter dust until we too stumble. Many people in this great unchurched area of western Washington will tell you that the reason they don't attend church is that they can't see any difference between the people inside the church and the people outside the church. Except that the people outside the church don't pretend to be better than they are. It's a sad commentary. If there is anyone in the world equipped to care for our neighbor, body and soul, no matter how difficult our neighbor's life may be, we are. We are God's baptized. God ordained us in these saving waters of grace to love our neighbor. In these waters, the scales have been washed away from our eyes and we have been given the gift of kingdom sight, kingdom hands, and kingdom feet, and importantly, kingdom power. Kingdom sight, to see the injustice, hunger, homelessness, creation's destruction that's occurring in the world. Kingdom hands to reach out to care for our neighbor, to care for creation, not just with words, but with action so that hope might live. We've been given kingdom feet to stand for what is right, to stand and act so that hope might live. And that, that, dear friends, is kingdom power. As Christians, we can see spirit as well as flesh. When we look at people, we can see them as whole, whole beings, as God meant them to be seen, God's beloved children. That's why as Christians, as Christ's disciples, we can't stand by while others are called names, belittled, oppressed, suffer injustice, or are abused with words that wound their souls. Because when that happens, when their souls are wounded, our souls are wounded, and the soul of God is wounded. Now, I don't believe that God has a cold storage room for amputated souls in the morgue like the Barbara Brown Taylor story. I believe God's will for all God's creation is to have full, abundant life, souls rich with Christ's love, when we don't live up to the love that Christ has put in our hearts and souls, well, we're in danger of putting ourselves and our souls 
in cold storage. A wasteful existence, I think, is an example of hell. No two ways about it. But the good news is, dear Christians, there is an alternative. If we want to be whole, to see others as whole, we can use our two good eyes to, to see the world as God sees it, to see injustice in this world. We can use our two good feet to carry us as deeply into the world as we dare to go. And we can carry us then, these feet can carry us to this table of grace. And we can there use our two good hands and arms to reach out and take the body and blood of Christ and receive grace that will remove that millstone of sin that we often carry around our necks. Remove it so that we might reach out to catch someone who is in danger of stumbling or who has already stumbled and trust in God to steady us all. For when all hell breaks loose in our lives and in our world and we we feel like we're at the end of our rope, remember, it is God who is holding on to us all. Thanks be to God. Amen.